my backyard in beautiful Los Angeles. How's everyone doing today? I hope you're well, happy, healthy, and having some fun. Today in Critter Chat, we're going to talk about a very amazing animal, um, one that has been on humans' minds for thousands of years. Uh, it's been debated over the years how this animal actually plays into the domestic horse, and uh, they finally figured it out science-wise. So today we're going to talk about Presvalsky's horse, also sometimes called Asian wild horses or simply just pea horse. They are also known as Taki in Mongolian, which means spirit. Now these horses, although at first glance they may look like a horse that you may see elsewhere, uh, they are quite a bit different. Uh, they're shorter than domestic ho horses, they're stocky, they're kind of muscular. Um, they also have kind of a pot belly. Um, it always looks like they're all pregnant, even the males. So they have a big belly. Um, they also have pretty large heads for the size of horse that they are. In addition to that, their mane, the hair on the back of their head, uh, is more like a zebra's than a horse. Most horses' manes kind of fall to one side or the other. Um, zebras have manes that are straight up and down, and that's what the Przewalski's horses have. It's uh, an erect mane, and up between their ears on top of their head, uh, most horses have like a little tuft of hair that comes forward. It's called a forelock and the pea horses do not have that either. They're typically a reddish brown or tan color um, with a lighter colored belly and dark legs below the knee. Um, sometimes that even appears almost like stripes, um, although in the photos I was looking at, none of the horses really had stripes, but in reading about them, it said that that does happen. They also have a dark stripe that runs along their uh, spine from where their mane ends to where their tail begins. Now when science got looking at pea horses and how they um, relate to domesticated horses, what they found out was pretty surprising. Specifically genetically, Przewalski's horse has 66 chromosomes, whereas domestic horses only have 64. And so scientifically, it is a very distinct, different species. Um, and like by comparison, a domestic horse with 64, a donkey has 62. Um, if a donkey and a horse breed, they can have a baby that is called a mule. It has 63 chromosomes and a mule is infertile. It cannot have babies. If a Przewalski's horse and a domestic horse breed, they can have a baby and that horse has 65 chromosomes, but that uh, baby can go on to breed. So it's a little bit interesting how that all works out, um, but it is definitely a different species than a domesticated horse. They look very, very similar to horses that are seen in cave paintings in Spain, France, and Italy from over 20,000 years ago. Uh, this leads some people to believe that the Przewalski's wild horse once roamed over a greater uh, habitat than where they can be found now or where they have been seen in recent times, possibly going as far as Spain all the way over into China. They were first described by Western science in 1881, and they were named after a Russian army officer named Nikolai Przewalski, who brought a skull and a hide to the museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, and presented it to the scientist and said, hey, this is this what crazy horse that I found over near Mongolia. What do you think? And they looked at it and decided, yes, this is a different species than other horse. Uh, genetically or physically, it looks different. At that time, they didn't know much about genetics, so they weren't studying that at that time. So they are native to the grasslands of, uh, sorry, lost my place. The grasslands, the foothills, and the semi-arid desert uh, areas where Mongolia, China, Kazakhstan, 
and uh, Russia kind of all come together in the middle of Asia. Now, during that time, they were um, described, of course, by Nikolai Przewalski. Other uh, Europeans traveling to Asia also described seeing them. Um, there are some older journal entries and stuff uh, talking about wild horses that were even before Przewalski's time, but they never uh, brought back any evidence of them. He was the first to bring back evidence. So over from 1881, when they were first described over the next uh, about 70 years, people became very intrigued with them. Um, and people who were running zoos in Europe at the time decided that they wanted to have some of these horses as part of their zoo. And they would go out on these great expeditions to try to collect some of them, to bring them back to the zoos. And they had kind of mixed success um, right around the late 1800s, early 1900s, 51 uh, Przewalski's horses were brought back to Europe that survived. Many of them that they captured died. And sometimes in the process of capturing, they were usually going after the babies. Uh, sometimes the adults were killed to do that. Different time frame then, different things were uh, happening. But over the next uh, decades after that, they noticed that the populations were decreasing and they were kind of never finding the uh, horses in the same areas. And although that was still kind of in primitive time when travel was not uh, super expansive, cars were just barely being invented. There were, certainly weren't roads in that area. Uh, I believe there were some trains hundreds of miles near there but nothing really going through that area. But they became more and more uh, rare to see. They actually were listed as extinct in the wild in 1969, uh, when a last stallion was officially observed and uh, documented to be there in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. There were some rumors that there were still some horses around up until the 1980s, but an expedition in 1982 and 83 by uh, scientists and conservationists out of China confirmed that there were no more pea horses to be found in the wild. So then the zoo populations became the only hope for this species. And luckily there were some uh, zoos in Europe that still had decent populations going although they had not had any uh, new horses brought in. The last one was brought in in 1947, uh, I believe in a German zoo. And some uh, zoo in Germany and maybe a couple other places had a few uh, pea horses still around. And uh, they had started moving them into the US at that time as well. But all of the horses that were in captivity were all descendants from the same 12 individuals. So genetically, they were all related to the same 12 horses. Um, and that was it. That was all that was left. But they started a very uh, comprehensive cooperative breeding program between zoos in many, many different countries throughout Europe, um, throughout North America, and a little bit into Asian zoos as well. And they worked really closely together to develop a, a genetic a uh, family tree of which horses were related to who and that's called a stud book. It's very important in like um, horse racing. So it was something that they were already doing in the private industry for horse racing. Uh, they also do it for like award winning cows and pigs and chickens and things. Um, but this was really one of the first times it was super organized for zoo animals and that it was being cooperative worked in zoos in many different countries. And it's a good thing that they did because they were all related to these 12 original uh, Przewalski's horses. And also there were two hybrid horses that were involved in that uh, genetically as well. So those were horses that were half Przewalski's horse, half domesticated horse. Um, in 1992, because they had then bolstered up the captive population quite a bit, um, 16 horses that had been born in zoos and conservation centers were released back into Mongolia after being gone 
uh, from that area for about 25 years. That is, is an area that later became a national park called Hustai National Park. And since that time, uh, many more horses have been reintroduced into four different sites in Mongolia, um, some in China, and one in Kazakhstan. In 2020, the global population of Przewalski's horses is estimated to be around 2,000, uh, with several hundred being in the wild and the rest in zoos or conservation centers around the world. Now, some of those conservation centers, particularly some of them in Europe, are huge, with huge herds that roam in very, very, very large pastures, uh, multiple square kilometers in size. Uh, some of the zoos here in the United States also have a very big uh, open range grasslands for them to roam in. Uh, there's a place in Texas called Fossil Rim Wildlife Center that's kind of a drive through safari park that has pea horses. Uh, they're featured also as one of the species um, at the Smithsonian National Zoo, but not at the zoo in DC, but at their conservation center that is in um, Virginia in a rural setting. There also uh, is a breeding herd at the San Diego Safari Park where they are very focused on working on uh, preserving the genetics that do still exist and helping to bolster the wild population. Przewalski's horses have a unique social structure. They typically live in two types of herds. Uh, one herd is called a harem, and that is one stallion, one boy, and multiple mares or females and their offspring. And these little herds are between 10 and up to maybe 20 individuals, depending on how many babies were born that year. And then the babies typically stay in their herd till they're about two years old. Um, the other herd is called a bachelor herd. And as you may have figured out, that's where the other male horses live. Um, they typically go to these herds when they're about two years old and stay there till at least five years old um, until they are older and stronger and can challenge other males for dominance to take over a harem herd. Uh, the herd is actually a closely knit group of females that kind of lets a male be part of their group. And he does all the breeding and he will chase out other males from the area uh, to prevent them from breeding with his females. Um, he also sometimes makes a few decisions as far as where the herd goes but it's really the bond between the females that makes the herd um, a cohesive unit. And they reinforce that bond by grooming each other. And the way they do that is they stand next to each other uh, with the head of one horse and the head of the other horse being at opposite ends. And they kind of nibble all the way across each other's backs and groom each other's uh, hair. And it's a very reassuring bond of their social structure, but it's often, um, friends, horse friends that are very uh, tight with each other, or sometimes they'll do it to reinforce uh, structure throughout their herd. They don't necessarily have a home range that, or a territory that they defend. They kind of go wherever the resources go. Uh, so they're typically looking for good grass and good water sources. In the wild, they can live up to about 25 years. Um, in captive settings like zoos, they can live into their 30s. Um, I think the record is around 36 years old. Um, and just a bit about their size, they are typically about six feet in length. Um, they stand between four and four and a half feet tall at their shoulder, and they weigh between 450 to 660 pounds. So that does put them quite a bit shorter and quite a bit, um, lighter weight than their domestic horse cousins. Their babies are born at about 65 pounds and after a gestation or pregnancy of 340 days. That's about 11 and a half months of pregnancy. So a very long time, um, but really not that different from domesticated horses who I believe are also their pregnancy is usually around 11 uh, months as well. So their major threats um, include climate situations, um, especially heavy winters. 
Um, heavy winters have caused big problems with many uh, members of the wild population that has since been reintroduced, dying off. Particularly the winter in 2010 was very hard and in one population uh, they lost about half of the horses that lived out in the wild due to a harsh winter. They also struggle when there are things like drought and that is um, both those can be very extreme situations in the habitat in which they live. It can be over 100 degrees in the summer and it can be under negative 20 in the winter so they have a huge fluctuation of temperatures and both can cause problems with them being able to find food and water. In addition to that, competition from livestock is a huge threat, especially for those water resources as they've been kind of pushed into some of those um, narrow habitat uh, lands and places where other people don't really want. Uh, it's very possible that the Przewalski's horse once roamed across a much broader area and that they slowly and slowly got pushed to the less desirable habitat. Um, there are many scientists who say that they're probably not even native to the Gobi Desert and Mongolia. That's just where they got pushed because it was the least desirable habitat for humans. And that they probably thrived over what is most of the Central Asian plain that is now used for agricultural land. Hunting was a big problem um, early on, and that's probably how they became extinct in the wild in the first place, that and competition from livestock, although it is much less of a threat today, um, particularly in Mongolia where they've been reintroduced. They are a very um, strong national symbol of pride and very well protected and respected by the local people. Uh, some areas in China where they've been introduced, they are also respected, and some areas in Kazakhstan, they are respected as well. But in both those countries, they face a little more um, hardship from local people who are just honestly trying to make a living. Mostly nomadic people who raise herds of goats or camels or uh, horses and cows and whatever else they're raising, uh, kind of in a wandering lifestyle. Also another threat for them is disease and in, in breeding uh, with domestic horses. So some of those um, horses owned by people that live out in those areas uh, sometimes will inbreed with them but also can bring disease uh, to the pea horses. And because their genetics are already compromised because all pea horses are related to the same 12 uh, original pea horses and the two hybrids, they're um, not as able to fight off disease as easily as most other species can. Now they are largely regarded as the only true wild horses on the planet today and you might think oh but wait there's wild horses in Arizona and there's wild horses in Utah and Nevada there's wild horses that live on the islands off the east coast of the United States. Yes there are free-ranging horses in all of those areas. Those horses are all descendants of domestic horses that either were let go or escaped that have since become feral and are living a wild lifestyle, although genetically they can be traced back to domestic horses. Przewalski's horses are truly wild and have never been domesticated as a species and have been roaming the plains of Europe for, or sorry, of Asia uh, for thousands of years, except for that 25 year period where there weren't any. Um, what I really want to drive home today though is that this species is still around today because of zoos. Because zoos had them and zoos were willing to work with each other and cooperatively breed and exchange animals and give away their babies to somebody else who could uh, breed those babies with their horses and bolster the population. It really shows the power of conservation um, that zoos and conservation centers can have when they work together to save a species. Um, there's a lot of really great science that's been done, including recently at the conservation center owned by the National Zoo that's located in Virginia, uh, recently uh, was able to have the first successful in vitro fertilization baby pea horse. Um, I'll share a video of that uh, later today on the Facebook. Our special shout out today is to an organization called the International Taki Group. Again, Taki is the word for this horse in Mongolian, that means spirit. 
Um, they run a website that is called Save the Wild Horse that documents uh, the horses in the Mongolian release sites and talks about uh, all the news and updates of the wild populations there. It's been really fascinating for me as a zoo nerd and an animal lover to watch this story unfold literally during my lifetime. I first heard about these uh, horses when I was in junior high and at that time they were extinct in the wild. There were none, zero. And it's been really fascinating for me to listen and learn and um, see how zoos have been able to help bolster the population and then release them back into the wild. And those horses that are out in the wild now uh, are thriving. Their population is increasing. When they first released them back, it was just uh, 16 horses. And now there are several hundred across multiple sites in Mongolia and a spot in China and a spot in Kazakhstan. There are hopeful plans to uh, create other release sites and um, possibly in Russia as well. Uh, this past year in 2019, they did see some really remarkable work um, at two of the sites in Mongolia where two horses who were leaving kind of their um, natal group, so they were like between two and three years old, they wandered out of the protected area and they followed them for quite a while and they went into uncharted territory for the horses that the horses had not been in for many, many years. And it's um, ideally located between one big release site and another big release site. And that is very good news and good potential for the population to continue to grow and expand into other land. And also mix up the genetics between this release site and this release site as these horses may someday mix up uh, with the others. So there is some really good hope uh, there's also still a lot of really good cooperative breeding um, going on with zoos and conservation centers. And I'll share some more information about that on the Facebook page later today. As always, feel free to like, share, follow, and subscribe to all of my content across Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and on my website at jeremythezoonerd.com. Until tomorrow, be happy, be healthy, have fun, stay safe. See you later.